TSM presents the final installment of a three part series. It documents how drug cartels are spreading terror in Juarez neighborhoods and making their presence felt in El Paso and southern New Mexico. Thank you for joining us tonight. I'm Natasia Paloma. Border Reports Julian Resendez examines the two faces of Juarez, and we do want to warn you some of the images you'll be seeing could be disturbing. Viewer discretion is advised. It was the summer of 2020 when parents in the El Paso region woke up to a sobering reality. The drug cartels were using their children. A Chevy Cruze driven by an El Paso teen smashed into a building flying off a curve on Paisano Drive. The high-speed crash claimed the lives of four El Paso residents ages 16 to 19 and three Guatemalan nationals. Authorities said the driver of the vehicle was involved in human smuggling. Three years later, the crashes have multiplied as have the injuries and deaths of U.S. citizens and migrants alike. Some law enforcement officials tell me that today, transnational criminal organizations in this region earn up to 50% of their income from migrant smuggling. Hiring U.S. citizens is not new for the drug cartels. What has changed? The people they are recruiting and how they are reaching out. El Paso and New Mexico teens are enticed to transport migrants with the recruiting taking place via social media apps and word of mouth. Uh, we're still continu continuing to see the cartel. We know for a fact is uh, they found in a sense the loophole of using the minors uh, as the getaway drivers as far as the uh, human smuggling. Uh, and the reason why is just basically the lack of uh, punishment or prosecution with regards to the minors here in New Mexico when we catch them. The cartels instruct their drivers to outrun the police. Law enforcement officials say this is the primary cause of the tragedies. Some community groups disagree. They say the pursuits themselves are contributing to the fatalities and should be stopped. The U.S. Border Patrol alerted the community to the teen driver's trend last spring. It's scary uh, to think that that uh, somebody's child could be convinced to drive a load vehicle into one of those situations. When they're driving and they're told not to stop for law enforcement, uh, to drive fast, to drive erratically, drive on the wrong side of the road. When all these things happen, accidents happen. The cartels don't care if American teenagers get hurt. When a human smuggling attempt fails, the cartels come across the border to get their money back. Students at Santa Fe High School who are being used to, or who are involved in these uh, smuggling uh, incidents, well, when they would lose the, the bodies, meaning they would get caught for whatever or however, and they're losing money, right? So then the cartel was sending people over to collect from the, those students. And we had one case of a robbery of a student uh, after school and a few other assaults and batteries. Lopez says the Gadsden School District this fall assigned additional school resource officers to the Santa Teresa campus. The school district declined an interview on camera. In addition to migrant smuggling, the cartels are recruiting American teens to bring fentanyl across the border in exchange for anything of value. Obviously, we have a huge fentanyl issue that's been occurring throughout this area. We see a significant impact with our youth uh, stealing vehicles or stealing items and taking them down and trading them out for fentanyl pills and bringing them back into the United States, transporting them through the county into the rest of the interior of, of America. The recruiting of their children adds to the stress parents are feeling in this southern New Mexico community where one in three residents is an immigrant and 29% of the population lives in poverty, according to the U.S. Census. Daniel Gamboa says he knows people his age whom the smugglers have tried to recruit to transport migrants. At night, you don't see so much border patrol. That's when people pick up the migrants. They risk their lives for very little money. I have known guys that have come to pick up people, but how long would that last? One month, two, and they end up in jail. Fernando Garcia is executive director of the Border Network for Human Rights. He says the cartels target young people from disadvantaged communities. And that's where the cartel grows, out of the desperate needs of those young people that actually don't, they, I mean, they cannot find employment. So they are somehow tempted to actually go and get easy money. You go to 
Canutillo, you go to Southern Park, you, you, you will see that those are colonies, they are poor people, they are poor, fam poor families. Uh, so the cartels are using that fact. And, 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 and they are coming over, and they are hiring these young people to actually do that work. The El Paso-based grassroots organization also has been working with federal officials to cut down on vehicle pursuits. We had to engage with Border Patrol. I mean, sit down with Border Patrol, putting pressure on Border Patrol for them to, for them to understand that it was not worth it to put actually human lives at risk. I think they understood and they changed the approach. A supervisor is now online every time border agents follow a suspected human smuggler on urban streets. The agency also tracks suspicious vehicles from a distance. That has led to numerous stash houses and thousands of migrant apprehensions. But other pursuits continue. So do the injuries and fatalities. Garcia recently witnessed a wreck during a Texas Department of Public Safety chase in West El Paso. He blames Texas Governor Greg Abbott's Operation Lone Star for allegedly making a bad situation worse. BNHR has documented the rise in DPS pursuits in El Paso from 13 in 2021 to 177 in 2023. That coincides with the start of Operation Lone Star. Abbott says the Biden administration has failed to protect Texans. Abbott has deployed hundreds of state troopers to the border. The Texas Army National Guard occupies the banks of the Rio Grande behind razor wire and military vehicles. The search adds to some residents' perception they are living in a state of siege. If we have any kind of invasion at the end of the day, it's an invasion of uh, state National Guard, state troopers within our community. DPS says letting smugglers get away with a car full of migrants exposes the migrants to kidnapping, forced labor, and sexual assault. When there's a pursuit that's going on, it's because we didn't start it. The person's not pulling over. So if it's an unsafe situation to where we're getting like school zones or there's a lot of traffic, it's uh, up to the trooper, but typically for the public safety, we'll terminate the pursuit. The cartels not only are endangering drivers on El Paso streets, but also keeping migrants in squalor and damaging rental homes in El Paso. Jeslaine Nevarez rented out her East El Paso home to a family that turned out to be into migrant smuggling. Her neighbors called her one day to tell her the Border Patrol was on the property. The locks had been changed, windows were broken, and the garage door was pried open. After everyone was removed, we were able to go in, my family and I, and inspect the property for any damages that may have occurred, and we did find quite a few. The total of the damages was about 15000 Of course, we were not able to to recover that money. The cartels are making their presence felt north of the border. So what can these communities do to fight them? Garcia suggests regional leaders create jobs and activities for young people so they are not tempted by money the cartels are tossing around like candy. On the law enforcement front, some would like to see increased by national cooperation rather than the U.S. sending troops to Mexico or firing missiles at cartel leaders. The experts also are calling for the U.S. and Mexico to address the root causes of drug use in America and the lure of the drug trade in Mexico. I'm a believer that it starts at the dinner table, right? I, I, I think that, you know, uh, over time we've got easy with the convenience of social media, but I also think that we lose touch with, with um, our own families. And I think there's an expectation that the government will take care of this and that, and the government was never formed to take care of that. Over the past three days, we have seen how transnational criminal organizations have sold terror in Juarez, Mexico, and extended their tentacles into West Texas and Southern New Mexico. We have challenged the Mexican government's discourse that 90% of the violence is gang on gang and does not touch ordinary citizens. We have shown you very strong images, but that is exactly what the residents of Colonias and their children are exposed to every day in our sister city. Also, we have monitored dockets in U.S. District Court in El Paso and New Mexico. We have found hundreds of cases involving migrant smuggling, migrant kidnapping and extortion, stash houses, drug couriers, 
weapon smugglers, and almost daily seizures of narcotics at US ports of entry. All of this is happening in a city that prides itself as being one of the safest in America, but that has been infiltrated by a clever and silent enemy, the drug cartels. Reporting from El Paso, Texas, Juarez, Mexico, in Southern Park, New Mexico, this is Julian Resendez. Our thanks to Julian for that. And if you missed this special report, if you missed any part of it, you can watch and read more on borderreport.com. We'll have more news and weather after this quick break. You're watching.